You might be wondering how a beach is related to a poker vlog. And really it's not. I just like it here. got a lot to discuss and it's not gonna be the happiest of discussions so I figured why not come to a happy place to at least have this conversation with you guys and one of my happy places is the beach it's one of my favorite places to be this one in particular is called Hermosa Beach about 10 or 15 minutes from the Hustler Casino and it's right next to the hotel where I'm at so I figured why not as you guys already saw from the title I'm on one of the biggest downswings of my life ever since the Aria session, things haven't gone very well. Uh, I played on Friday and Saturday, 5-10, lost both sessions. Then came over here to The Hustler where I was scheduled to play on two different live streams. Without any further ado, let's head into those two sessions and give you guys a recap of what happened. All right, guys, here we go. Playing some 1020 No Limit Hold'em, often with a $40 straddle, so a pretty big game here at the Hustler. I buy in for $10,000, and in the first interesting hand, there's a $40 straddle on, and the player on my right opens to 80, so a minimum sized raise. Doesn't seem like a great hand, so when I look down at Queen 10 off on his left, I decide it's good enough for a re raise. So I bump it up, and he makes the call. We go heads up to a flop of 644, no flush draw available. Pretty good board for me, so when he checks, I continue with a small bet, and he makes the call. Turn card is the Deuce of Hearts. Shouldn't really change much aside from 5-3 now becoming a straight, but I still think it's a good card to continue barreling on. It's gonna put a lot of his weaker holdings in a tough spot. So I size up to about two-thirds pot, and this time he lets it go. Turns out we actually had the best hand, as you guys can see, but uh, starting off the night with a small but successful bluff. In the next hand, we decide to play a $100 bomb pot, and we go multi-way to a flop of 7-5 deuce rainbow. I look down at 8-7 off, so good enough for top pair. When the action checks to me, I decide to bet $300 here. Could use some protection against overcards, and I'm often gonna have the best hand, so that's what I do, and Armenia might calls on my left, but everyone else gets out of the way. Turn card is the four of diamonds, which is an interesting card because I think we'll often still have the best hand, but it should give him a lot of equity with hands like a pair and a straight draw, or perhaps a backdoor flush draw, who knows? Mike calls with a lot of stuff. So I think it's still worth a value bet. Don't need to go too big here, so I decide to bet $650. And once again, Armenian Mike makes the call. When we go to the ace of diamonds on the river, I don't really think there's much value in betting at this point. The board is pretty dangerous for our exact hand, so I decided to check it. And now Mike bets around $5,000 or something. Definitely not calling with a pretty bad pair on this board, so I let it go right away. Turns out he had pocket eights, which was the best hand all along. In the next one, I look down at ace jack in late position. I open it up to 120, $40 straddle is on once again. Now Landon and the small blind re-raises to $540. Action gets back to me, and with ace-jack off, I'm pretty sure the best play is to either fold or put in another raise, but this time I decide just to flat call and play in position. We go to a flop of queen 10 9 which gives us a straight draw, but not much else aside from that. Landon continues with a bet of $450. Not much to do besides call here, so that's what I do. Turn card isn't great though, it's the nine of clubs pairing the board. When he continues betting now, I don't really think it's a good idea to look to hit our straight. We could be up against a full house if we do get there, and you know, there's really not that many cards that improve us anyway. So after thinking it over for a bit, I decide just to let it go. 
In the next hand, we play a bomb pot once again. This time I look down at eight three of diamonds and we go to a 10, eight, seven flop with two diamonds. So a pair and a flush draw can never be too terrible. There's a bet in early position of $300. Player on my right calls and I decide just to proceed with a flat call. Armenia Mike calls on my left, so four of us go to a turn card, which is the four of spades. This time the player who bet the flop decides to check, and now the guy on my right, who was the first caller on the flop, bets $1,700, a pretty sizable bet, but considering that we could still improve to a flush or perhaps an eight to give us the best hand, I decided to make the call, but definitely proceeding with caution. Mike folds, but the initial better on the flop makes the call, so three of us going to a river, Looking for some help here, which sadly does not come. It's the queen of spades. First player checks it, but Dr. AC wants no such thing. He decides to bet $1,900. I do contemplate a raise here just for a second because it seems pretty unlikely he would ever have spades. But then I remember there is a player behind who certainly could have spades, like 10x of spades. So I just end up letting it go, and it turns out that's actually what we were up against from the player behind us. So good thing I did not pull the trigger. Anyway, of course, with the nuts, Holo goes all in, and Dr. AC actually ends up finding a pretty nice fold. In the next one, I look down at pocket tens, I open it up to 120, Mike calls on my left, and now Cowboy John in late position raises it up to $600. Action gets back to me, and against this player, I don't really think I ever have the best hand. Maybe he's got ace-king, but most likely we're up against a bigger pair. For that reason, I think it's a good idea to call and try to hit a set. So that's what I do, and Mike calls as well. So three of us going to a flop, which is 6-5-3, rainbow. Action checks to John again, and he continues with a bet of $1,400. Now, I know I said that we're most likely up against a bigger pair, but the reason I think it's okay to call one more time at least is, well, because we've got an over pair, so in case he is bluffing with ace-king, it doesn't seem like a good idea to just fold right away. And also, the board is such that perhaps we can steal the pot later on. I don't know, a few possible ideas that could come to fruition. I decide to call, and Mike calls as well. Turn card is a jack, so close to a 10, but not quite. Once again, I check, and now Mike decides to just rip his entire stack in. Cowboy John's got a pretty easy call on his hands. This pretty much gives me no option but to get out of the way at this point, so that's what I do. And of course, the river is a 10. Moving right along, in the next hand, we look down at Jack-10 off from early position. I raise it up to 120, should probably be folding this hand most of the time, but once in a while I think it's fine. Zeo calls on the button, and Ronnie calls in the straddle. So three of us going to a flop, which comes ace, six, deuce, rainbow. Pretty innocent flop, and one that I think I'll have most of the strong hands on, so when it checks to me, I continue with a one-third pot-sized bet. Zeo gets out of the way, but Ronnie now decides to check raise pretty small, just to $300. And I think this is mostly just going to consist of top pair, hands like ace-9, ace-10, ace-jack, maybe even some weaker aces. And I mean, I can't blame him, but in position, facing such a small check raise, I think it's going to be okay to just call here and turn our hand into a bluff later on, since we could still have some strong hands like aces, ace-king, pocket sixes, and that'll allow us to apply a lot of pressure to his one pair holdings. So that's what I do. I decide to float with Jack High. Turn card is the 10 of spades, improving us to a pair, but Ronnie's not too concerned as he continues with a bet of $420. And well, even though we pair up, I think it's time to put that plan into action. If he's got a hand like Ace Jack or Ace Nine, it's gonna be pretty tough to hold on if I raise here and then bomb the river. So that's what I do. I kick it up to $1,400. Now he starts thinking about it for a long time. I'm not really expecting a fold right away, but pretty confident that we could get one on the river. Turns out it won't come to that as Ronnie shows me an ace and ends up folding. So this one goes according to plan. In the next hand, I look down at pocket jacks in early position, raise it up to 120. Mike calls on my left, Landon calls as well, and so does Ronnie in the straddle. So four of us going to a very nice looking flop of 6-4-4. Action checks to me, and I decide to get a little bit tricky here because Mike had been stabbing a lot when check to, and I kind of like the idea of check raising if Mike bets and the other two players fold. So that's what I do, and that's what ends up happening. Mike bets $700. However, Landon thinks about it for a bit and makes the call. When Ronnie gets out of the way and action gets back to me, I'm a little bit concerned that Landon could be laying in the weeds with a really strong hand, like maybe pocket sixes or 
any sort of four, so I decided to proceed with some caution and just call, seeing what develops on the turn, which is the Ace of Clubs. Obviously not my favorite card as it's an over card to my pocket jacks, but really it seems pretty unlikely that we would ever be up against an ace in this situation, unless somehow Mike was stabbing the flop with an ace high type of hand or landing called with ace high, both of which seem really unlikely. So when Mike continues with a bet of $1,100 and this time Landon folds, I'm pretty confident we've got the best hand, but definitely not going to be raising either. So I proceed with just a call. River is the queen of clubs, introducing the backdoor clubs, but again, I really think it's just a brick. Once again, I check it, and after thinking it over for a while, Mike checks it back. Pretty much expecting to win a good chunk of the time here, but this is not going to be one of those times, as it turns out Mike had ace six, as you guys can see here. So he was betting with a six on the flop. Unfortunately, his kicker paired up as well on the turn, and we lose another one here. Anyhow, those were all the interesting hands from the first session. When it was all said and done, I lost about two or 3,000 on stream, but did end up playing for about an hour or two after the stream and got back most of those losses. So let's move along to the next night where we played 5550, meaning it's a 5-5 game with a $50 big blind ante, kind of a unique Los Angeles thing that pops up once in a while. All you need to know is it pretty much plays like a 2550, maybe a 4080, no limit. It's a pretty big game with people constantly straddling to 100 and 200 pre flop. So I decided to buy into this game for $15,000 and start off the night pretty card dead until I finally look down at a decent hand, pocket sixes in the $50 straddle. There's an open from late position, a caller in the hijack, and then Eli in the big blind raises it up to $700. Now it's a little bit weird for us since we've got a pocket pair, but we're facing a raise and a re-raise already. However, given the sizing and Eli's body language when he raised it up to 700, it just didn't seem like that strong of a hand. And I kind of had a hunch that pocket sixes were still the best hand. So I decided to put in the re-re-raise, not something I would really advocate for with a medium pocket pair, but once in a blue moon when the situation's right, I don't really hate it. So that's what I do and Eli makes the call but the other two players fold. So heads up in position to a flop of ace queen four with a flush draw. Obviously a pretty terrible flop for my exact hand, but definitely a board that I could have some strong hands on. So when he checks it to me, I decide to continue with a small bet, much like I would with all my holdings. As you guys can see, it's definitely not gonna work here as we're up against two pair. Eli raises right away, letting me know exactly how good my hand is. I just let it go, but end up losing a good chunk of money in the process. Moving right along to the next hand, we see an open from Reza in early position. I look down at King-Queen in late position and decide to re-raise. Don't really want to call and then have someone squeeze behind. I make it 800, and now Ethan on the button cold calls with Ace-Jack suited. Gets back to Reza, and he calls as well. So three of us going to a flop of King-Deuce-Deuce with a flush draw. Pretty good board for me, so when it checks to me, I continue with a small bet. Ethan gets out of the way, but Reza is not done with it just yet as he makes the call. Turn card is probably the worst one in the entire deck. It's the Ace of Hearts. So if for any reason Reza was floating with a hand like Ace Queen or Ace Jack, he now beats us. And of course, all possible flushes are beating us now as well. Not to mention, you know, he could have a deuce as well. So this time when he checks it to me, I think I'm happy to check it back. River card is the Four of Clubs, and now Reza decides to bet right around half pot, $2,200. Now we're in a really miserable situation. If he had a hand like King Jack or King 10, I would expect him to just check the river. And if he had an ace or a flush, I would expect him to bet. I really just can't come up with any bluffs in this situation. So after thinking it over for a bit, I decide to fold. And as you guys can see here, he had pocket tens, which is a pretty interesting hand to turn into a bluff. But I gotta say credit to him because it worked perfectly. Kind of unfortunate to get the ace of hearts on the turn though, as we otherwise would win this hand almost every time. In the next hand, I look down at jack nine in late position of the suited variety, so I raise it to $300. Ethan now re-raises me in the small blind to $1,300, and then Randall Emmett cold calls in the straddle. Action gets back to me, and if it was just me and Ethan, I think I would just let this hand go, but being that we're getting a pretty good price now that Randall called in the straddle, I think it's fine to continue. We're also pretty deep here against Ethan, so plenty left to play for in position. 
And we go three ways to a flop of queen, eight, six with two hearts. Pretty damn good flop. We flop a straight draw and a flush draw. Actually, a straight flush draw, now that I'm looking closely. Anyway, Ethan goes first, and he decides to bet $1,500. Randall now decides he's had enough and goes all in with pocket sevens. Ashen gets back to me, and now we're in a somewhat precarious spot because if we call here, Ethan can back raise. However, I don't think Ethan would do that because we could certainly just be calling with a hand like pocket sixes, pocket eights. 8-6 suited, you know, we could have some traps here. So I decided to just call, and it turns out he does not put in a raise. He just calls as well. So we're going to a dry side pot here with a pretty hefty pot already of right around $15,000. But that's fine, we've got plenty of equity. We could hit any heart or any 10. The six of clubs is not one of those cards though. So when Ethan checks it to me, I'm definitely not going to be bluffing into a dry side pot as even if he folds, we still have to beat whatever Randall's got to win the pot. So I just check it back and take the free card, which is a king of clubs. So we brick everything and we're sitting here with jack high. Once again, Ethan checks, pretty easy check back and give up now. And we end up losing. So nice hand, Ethan. Sadly, Randall and myself lose a nice chunk of money in this one. Moving right along in the next hand, I'm in the straddle with ace four of spades. Reza raises in the small blind, Eli calls, and I think a suited ace is a pretty good candidate to squeeze with here. We're in position and we're up against two hands that don't necessarily have to be very strong. So I put in the re-raise to 950. Reza makes the call and Eli calls as well. So both players not going away just yet. Three ways to a flop of queen, six, three, rainbow with one spade. Pretty good board for me, I think. It's a really dry flop. We could have some over pairs, we could have queens, we could have ace queen, king queen, all sorts of stuff. And my opponents really shouldn't be too strong here aside from maybe pocket sixes and pocket threes. So I'm happy to start barreling now, probably get this hand heads up going to a turn, and most likely continue to apply pressure on a variety of turn cards. However, we won't ever get the chance because Eli now decides to check raise with pocket deuces after Reza gets out of the way. Not entirely sure the purpose of this raise. It seems like I'll just fold all my bluffs and call with all better hands, but hey, credit to him because he wins the pot, right? In the next one, I look down at pocket threes. There's an open from the button. Eli calls in the big blind. I call in the straddle and Ronnie who limped in for 50 calls as well. We go to a flop four ways, which finally we flop something on. It's six, three deuce rainbow. So we got middle set against the player who most likely has got a strong hand here on the button. Action checks all the way to him, and he continues with a bet of $1,100. Seems like good news to me, as I doubt he'd be bluffing into three other players. So definitely going to be looking to get the max against an over pair here. Even more music to my ears is that Eli now calls in the big blind, so I happily raise it up to $3,100 now. Unfortunately for us, Cowboy John was actually bluffing with Ace Queen, so he's going to get out of the way. But Eli calls once again, so a pretty good spot here, especially when we're up against an opponent who does not like to fold, it seems. Turn card is disastrous, though. It's the four of spades, so now any five makes a straight. Eli checks it over to me, and I mean, we could check back here and see what happens on the river, or we could go all in and target hands that now improve to a straight draw as well. After thinking it over for a bit, I decided to just get it all in here and try to get him to call with the worst hand. He only had around $7,000 anyway, and the pot was much larger than that. So that's what I do, and Eli thinks it over for a while before folding. So we don't get the max here, and I think that terrible turn card is partially to blame. In the very next shuffle, action folds once again to Cowboy John in late position, who raises it up to $200. We see another call from Eli in the small blind, and then I look down at Jack-9 offsuit in the big blind. Now, most of the time I think it's fine just to call here, maybe even fold, but I think sometimes putting this hand into the re-raise category is fine, especially so in this situation because Cowboy John had been raising pretty large with his good hands, like 400 or 450 pre-flop, so now that he makes it just 200, I had the feeling it wasn't a very strong hand and we could probably get away with some aggressive play post-flop, so I decided to re-raise it this time. Cowboy John makes the call, and so does Eli. So we go three ways to a flop, which is an interesting one. Queen, Jack, nine with a flush draw out there. So we flop bottom two on a pretty dangerous looking board, but all the same, it's a pretty strong hand to flop. So when the action gets to me, I happily continue with a bet of $1,500, right around half pot. 
Cowboy John makes the call and Eli makes the call as well. As you guys can see, we're very likely to win this hand unless, of course, an eight comes on the turn. Shutting down all the action except for anyone who's got a 10. As you guys can see here, both of these guys did and they managed to get all in on the turn. So this one not going our way either. In the next hand, action folds to Reza in the small blind who makes it 275. Action gets to me in the straddle with king out of hearts. I happily defend in position and we go to a flop of ace nine five on which we flop the nut flush draw. Pretty good situation. So when Reza continues for $600, I happily make the call. Let's just try to hit a heart, which we do. Very nice. It's the five of hearts. The only catch is that it pairs the board, but if he's got a full house, God bless him, take all my money. Reza continues with a thousand dollar bet. Now we can mix between just calling or raising it up. I decide just to call and see what he wants to do on the river, which is the king of clubs. Now Reza slows down and checks it. And being that we didn't raise on the turn, I think we definitely got to make up for some value here on the river. So I decide to go for $3,500 into a $3,800 pot. Now Reza wastes very little time before deciding on a quick call. I flip it over and we're good. So finally a decent sized pot going our way. In the next hand, there's a $200 late position open. Player on his left calls and so does Reza in the small blind. Action gets to me in the third blind, AKA the straddle. And I look down at ace 10 offsuit. Now with this hand, I think it's fine to mix between raising and flat calling. I think in this exact game, it's best just to flat call and only raise value hands because no one was folding and everyone was bluffing a bunch. So not really the type of lineup where getting out of line preflop does much good. However, as you guys can probably guess, I did not make that decision in this instance. I decided to raise it up, most likely knowing that I've got the best hand. Ronnie folds, Patrick folds, but Reza calls again in the small blind. All things considered, that's actually a pretty good result because we end up going heads up against the one player we have position against. So when we see 8-8-3 eight, eight, on the flop with two clubs, pretty dry board, we've got the ace of clubs, and it's just going to be a flop where Reza doesn't really connect too often. He's going to have all sorts of Broadway cards and... Who knows, it's Reza, right? So I decided to continue with a small bet here of right around one fourth pot. Reza is having none of that and quickly check raises me to $2,500. Now up to this point, Reza had been doing quite a lot of check raising and bluffing and showing down bad hands at showdown when getting called. I didn't include that in this vlog because they weren't hands that I was involved in, but just giving you guys the background and sort of explaining why I think a call here is totally fine. We could figure it out later on and we could very likely still have the best hand. So I decide to call and see what happens on the turn, which is the five of clubs. So now we improve to the nut flush draw. This time Reza checks it. I don't really see any value in betting here, so I check it back. River card comes and it's the six of hearts. Pot is right around $8,000 and after thinking it over for a bit, Reza decides to bet $6,000. Now I know what you're thinking, we've got ace high and it's a very clear fold and I wouldn't disagree with that but in the moment I just wasn't thinking as clearly as I do some other times. Maybe a little bit sick of not winning in the session and not winning the day before and I've got the ace of clubs so it's less likely he's got the nut flush and it just doesn't make a lot of sense for him to pick the sizing unless he's got a very good hand like a full house or a flush. And when people are representing really strong hands, I usually talk myself into making light call downs because, you know, it's hard to have it every time, right? Not really saying this is a good call. In fact, I think it's a pretty terrible one. But I did end up deciding to call with ace high here. And as you guys can see, it's not going to be a good call as we get shown a flush. Not really my uh, most proud moment, but, uh, you know, that's how it goes sometimes. You make ace high call downs and sometimes they're great. Other times they're a disaster and... This one is gonna be in the disaster category. Moving right along, this one we looked down at Jack 10 of hearts uh, and opened it up to $300. There was a $100 straddle on. Ronnie calls in the cutoff and Eli calls in the straddle. Three ways to a flop of ace, seven, six with two hearts. Ace high board and we've got a flush draw. I see no reason not to continue. So I place a bet of $450. Ronnie, as you guys can see, flopped top two pair. So he's gonna raise it up, but he only makes it 1100, which is not even that big, so I decided to continue with the call after Eli folds. Turn card is the three of diamonds, obviously not improving us. I check it to him once again, and this time he bets right around two thirds pot, $2,300. 
Can't really call here out of position with jack high, so our options are to either check raise all in or just fold. This time I decide just to fold since I didn't have the idea that Ronnie had a hand he was willing to fold. In the last hand of the night, unfortunately we are down to our last $2,300. That was all the cash I brought with me. It was right around 25 or 30K. And I looked down at ace queen off. I decided to just get it all in here. Probably gonna get some pretty light calls here since it looks like I could be doing this with all sorts of junk. Luckily this time I have a pretty strong hand, so when Reza calls, fingers crossed that we hold against King Jack off. And as you guys can probably guess, that did not happen as we see a jack high board. And that was it. It was brutal, it was fast, it was violent. It felt like I never really had the best hand. And you know, no matter how good or bad you are or how well you play, this game can be pretty damn hard if you almost never have the best hand. So that's it for me. I decided to call it a night and live to fight another day. So yeah, what to say after losing almost $30,000 between two sessions, it's not easy, you know, there's not a lot you can say, but I know there's gonna be a few questions that are gonna be frequently asked, so let me do my best to sort of get those out of the way. First of which uh, is I did have all of my own action in both of these games, didn't sell anything, didn't swap anything. It was just my own money on the table. The second thing a lot of people might be wondering is why did you play such a big game if 510 and you know my usual stakes seem to be going pretty well? It's not really something I touch on a lot in these vlogs, but I do have an ambition to climb the stakes and continue to play as big as I can, as often as I can. And that's just a natural progression of things. Uh, this year went really well for me in all aspects, especially poker. And I knew that eventually this was the only way to continue moving forward is to just play bigger games and hope to do well. And like many times before, if not every time, it was a complete disaster my first time trying a bigger game. You know, I consider myself a competent player at the very least, so to jump up in stakes on the big stage and get completely destroyed wasn't easy to process mentally, emotionally, financially, and this is just me trying to be transparent with you guys. But that's it. It's uh, thanks to you guys and all your support that I make these videos. I still enjoy having this YouTube channel to vent to and I still find it very humbling that so many people are interested in my personal poker career. Until next time guys, thanks for all your support. Good luck at the tables. Peace.